Hi everybody, so today we're going to be talking about ependymal cells and the choroid plexus and how we make cerebral spinal fluid. So let's go ahead and we'll get started. And basically what you're looking at here is the inside of the brain, okay? So to give you an idea of the structure, is what I'm going to do is let's pretend we have a person and they are looking this way, right? There's their nose, there's their mouth, and they are looking this way. And then we decide to do a coronal cut on this person and we remove the front part of the brain and the skull, right? So now we have this here, and we're looking at it like this, and then I'm gonna turn it and face it this way. So now pretend like you're looking at the brain like this. So imagine you take my face off, and now you're looking at my brain, and this is what you have here. This is some of the structures, okay? So what you would be looking at is, if we look, the first thing we have is we have these epithelial cells that are here. So this is gonna be my brain, extracellular space, right, which is going to contain brain extracellular fluid. And then inside of here, we're going to have extracellular space also. So we're going to have extracellular space in here, which is going to contain extracellular fluid. So that's brain extracellular fluid. This is just going to be extracellular fluid here. If you notice, we're going to have this barrier right here. And this is going to be made up of epithelial cells. So now, these epithelial cells are going to separate this extracellular fluid that's inside this ventricle here from the brain extracellular fluid. So once again, this is looking at the ventricle. So this is going to be my lateral ventricle, right? That's my lateral ventricle. Then this is the extracellular fluid. So all outside of this green is going to be my extracellular fluid. This is also a lateral ventricle here. Down in here, I'm going to have my third ventricle. Okay, so that's going to be my third ventricle that's right there. If you notice, we have this green line here. Now what these are going to be is these are going to be specialized cells. They're going to be specialized ependymal cells or choroid epithelial cells. Okay, so that's going to be this here. And then when you see these finger-like projections here, we're going to call this the choroid plexus. So this choroid plexus, and this is going to be made up of epithelial cells, specialized choroid, or I'm sorry, choroid epithelial cells, which are going to be a, a modified form of ependymal cells. And that's going to be right there. Now, in here, we're going to make our cerebral spinal fluid. So if you notice, we have this membrane that goes around here right? And this membrane is going to separate the cerebral spinal fluid from the extracellular fluid. And this membrane here separates the extracellular fluid from the, the brain extracellular fluid, okay? So we're separating all of this out. So what I'm going to do now is we are just going to take a view of this portion that's right here, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so now we've taken this portion here and we blew it up so it's right here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the blood supply to this. So the blood supply to the choroid plexus is going to be done by two different arteries. And they're going to be the anterior, the anterior and posterior choroidal arteries. Okay, and that's going to supply this. Now, the blood flow through this is 10 times greater. It's about 10 times greater than the blood flow that goes through the rest of the cerebral arteries. This is also going to be innervated by nerves. So I'm going to draw a nerve right here, right? And we're going to have our nerve coming down, and it's going to come to my choroid plexus. Now, here's what's going to happen with the nerves. is It's going to have a sympathetic portion, and it's going to have a parasympathetic portion. So the sympathetic is going to cause is going to cause a decrease in CSF. The parasympathetic is going to cause an increase in CSF. Okay, so we got those. Now, if you notice right in the middle here, we're gonna have a capillary. So we have our anterior and posterior cor choroidal artery. This is going to be a capillary. These capillaries are outside the blood-brain barrier and they're going to be leaky. So we're going to call these leaky capillaries. And I only drew one 
but you actually have several of these. And this is what's going to happen, is we're going to get fluids and plasma and things such as that coming out of here, right? Because again, they're not in the blood-brain barrier, so we don't have those tight junctions that we have in the blood-brain barrier. In fact, we call these fenestrated. Okay, so these are fenestrated, and we're going to have fluid coming out pretty easy into this area that's in here. Now, once again, this area that's in here, we're going to call this the extracellular space, and it's going to have extracellular fluid. But what we don't want is we don't want this going out into our cerebral spinal fluid like we said over here, right? So what's going to happen is on these modified ependymal cells or these choroidal epithelial cells, we are going to have tight junctions on here that go all the way around this, and this is going to act like our barrier here. Okay, so we're going to have these tight junctions, and these tight junctions are going to form what we call, what we call the, they're going to help form the blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier. So we don't have the blood brain barrier, we have the blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier. So that's going to keep uh, fluids that come out of this capillary and into this extracellular fluid from mixing here in this area in here. And then remember, what we're going to have in here is cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, some things real quick on this. If you notice, these are going to have microvilli. This part is going to be called the apical end. Okay, the apical membrane. And then this part in here, this is going to be the basal lateral membrane. Okay, so we're going to have fluids coming out from here, but they're not going to be able to cross through here and go into there. And by the way, you're going to notice that these actually have microvilli on them. And they're going to have, let me go like this, they're going to have cilia on them. And the cilia is going to help move the cerebral spinal fluid. So let's take a look at what's going to happen here, because now we're going to talk about how we go from here into where the cerebral spinal fluid is and how we make cerebral spinal fluid. So let's go ahead and take a look at this epithelial cell that's right here. And basically, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have this epithelial cell that's right here. So we're going to have this epithelial cell that's right here, right? This is going to be my basal end, my basal lateral membrane. And then this is going to be the apical end. Now, I'm not going to draw cilia on these. Maybe if I have room left over at the end, I will. But remember, we have the microvilli here. So we have the leaky, we're going to have our leaky capillary over here. Okay, there's our leaky capillary. So now, here's what's going to happen is we're going to get fluids that are going to come out from here, right? And this is basically going to be, this is basically going to be our extracellular fluid that comes out from here. And we're going to get ions coming out from here. We want to move some of this from here to here. So making CSF is actually going to be a two-step process. The first thing that we're going to do is we are going to have things, like I said, we're going to have things go from the extracellular fluid out here into our cerebral spinal fluid. It's going to come out here into the cerebral spinal fluid. So this portion here is going to contain the CSF, right? So what's going to come through here? Well, we're going to have sodium coming through, right? We're going to have sodium coming through. We're going to have chloride ions, ions coming through. We are going to have we are going to have bicarbonate coming through, and we are going to have water coming through. Okay, we're going to have water coming through. So all of those we're going to want to bring from here out into here. Now going the opposite direction, we are going to have potassium going through. So let's take a look at how these get into this epithelial cell and out over into here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with this sodium here. Sodium is also going to be a two-step process. So we're going to start with a... We're going to have a sodium-potassium pump. I'm going to put the sodium-potassium pump 
right here. So this is my sodium potassium pump. And what's going to happen is I'm going to have sodium, right? And sodium's going to be pumped into the CSF. Well, if sodium's pumped into the CSF, potassium is going to be pumped out of the CSF, right? So the potassium comes out, right? But the potassium now can go through channels and basically, for the most part, it's going to come back into the CSF, right? So it goes through channels and come back into the CSF. The other thing that's going to happen now is now that I've pumped sodium into here, now I can have sodium pass over here on the basal lateral membrane. So now this is what's going to happen. It's on this membrane, I am going to have an exchange protein. And so what's going to happen is I can get sodium that's come out from the leaky capillary, and then it can come into this epithelial cell, make its way over, and then be pumped into here. The thing about this is, though, is this relies on having a hydrogen going back the other way. So where do we get this hydrogen from? Well, let's talk about that in just a minute, because I want to talk about this real first. This first. Right here, I am going to have another channel. And this channel, we are going to call aquaporin-1. So I'm going to have the water. It's going to come through here. And then it's going to go through another aquaporin-1 and make its way into the CSF. OK? That's one thing that I can do there. The other thing that's going to happen is this water can go. And inside, inside of here, I'm going to have carbonic anhydrase in here. And if you recall, carbonic anhydrase can take this water, so here comes my water, and this water can split. So there's my H2O, and it can become a hydroxide, right? And then what it can do is it can mix with a carbon dioxide, and then what it can, what it'll become is it will become a bicarbonate. Okay, it will become a bicarbonate. Now, the other thing that's going to happen is I can also get the hydrogen, which is going to help exchange and bring that sodium in. So let's, we'll come back to this in just a minute. Let's talk some more about sodium and how it gets inside the cell. So here's the other thing that sodium can do, is we have another co-transporter here, right? And on this co-transporter, what can happen is I can have sodium come in Right? Here comes my sodium, and at the same time, it's going to have a bicarbonate come in. So now my bicarbonate comes in. Right? At the same time, what I could do is I can also have another protein, and what this protein will do is it will also bring sodium in. Right? So here comes my sodium coming in again. Right? And this sodium comes in here, but this is also going to require two bicarbonates, and then that's going to come into here. Now, we're going to come back to this bicarbonate in just a minute, but I want to talk about something real important real quick. Because if you look, I have these bicarbonates that are in here, and I have this one here. But we want to go now. Let's talk about this chloride here. Okay, so we're going to talk about this chloride. So what's going to happen with chloride? How does it get into the cell? Well, we're going to have another cotran or an exchange protein right here. Right, here's my exchange protein, and what this exchange protein is going to do is it's going to cause this bicarbonate to go out, but at the same time, that's going to bring a chlorine, a chloride ion in, right? So that comes in. Also, if you notice here, I have these two coming in, but what's going to be exchanged here is I also have a chloride going out through there also. Okay, and we're going to come back to that chloride in just a minute. Let's go back to this here. We have these here now. I'm starting to get these, these bicarbonates in here, right? So here's my bicarbonates. And then what's going to happen is in here, I can actually have sodium with three of those bicarbonates. And what these will do is th these will all come through and then they're going to come here into the CSF. Boom. And so now i got the sodium coming in here. 
I got this bicarbonate in here. And the reason it's important to have bicarbonate come in here is because of the fact that we want to make sure that we keep this, the nerves neutral because uh, they become acidic as, as we, they become acidic as we, uh, they become acidic. So they're going to become acidic as they fire, okay? So we want to make sure that we have enough of the bicarbonates coming in, which is a base to keep everything neutralized. So I got my potassium coming in and then going back out. Now the other thing that potassium can do, let's go down here real quick because this is going to require something called a transporter. And this transporter we are going to call the sodium, the sodium potassium chlorine transporter. Okay, and so these are going to come back in. Now here's what's going to happen is I'm going to have another co-transporter here and I can have my potassium come in and go right back into here or I can have my end, I can have my chlorine which is going to come in and it can come right back into here also. My, my, so, my sodium can come through here and then it can go to one of these sodium potassium pumps and it's going to be pumped out like this here. So basically that's going to happen there. Okay, let me put the sodium potassium pump there. Remember this is going to require ATP. This is going to require ATP, right? And then last but not least, the other thing I can have is I can also have a protein channel. And what this protein channel is going to do is it's just going to move my chloride ion out into here. So you can see we have potassium coming here. There's a lot less potassium in the CSF than there is over here in this extracellular fluid, right? And they think, they think the reason for that, or because of that, they think that what happens to some of this potassium is it's going to make its way into the capillary and then it's going to be carried away from this area. So that's it for epithelial cells or choroidal epithelial cells, also known as modified uh, ependymal cells. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like and subscribe button, and we will catch you next time. Thanks again for watching.